Yeah, thanks, Bangalore, for turning up in these kind of numbers. Uh, I know the, <laughs> on a Sunday evening, I know the unemployment rate is fairly high, but I'm still guessing <laughs> some of you have to go to work tomorrow. So thank you for that. Um, just to get a sense of the room, uh, how many of you have read this book already or followed uh, Dr. Prabhakar's? Okay, that's a fair representation because it's always difficult to talk about a book to an audience that hasn't read it. You're quoting from the book or you're referring to something in the book and, and you get blank faces. Uh, what we hope to do is keep it more general, keep it thematic, not necessarily go chapter by chapter. Uh, as it turns out, we are here still suffering from the, or, or enjoying the hangover of yesterday, uh, the Karnataka election results. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> I presume that applause is for the Congress. OK. That makes sense. Um, so in the wake of the results, there have been two distinct, uh, there's been a lot of analysis. A lot of it is complete BS. Uh, but broadly, it fits into two categories. One category of people who say, look, it's just a state election. doesn't matter. It's not a reflection on Modi. This doesn't uh, you know, have any implications for 2024 or even for the forthcoming state elections. There's another stream of thought which says, oh, this is a triumph of hope over hate. Um, I actually don't quite agree with either of them. As far as the triumph of hope over hate is concerned, I still can't get over the fact that somewhere between 36 and 38% of the electorate actually voted for the BJP. So let's not you know, make too much of it. There are implications, and maybe we'll get to that. But that leads to the question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, in your book, there is a line that says, and I'll quote, the crisis that the Indian Republic faces will not disappear with the electoral defeat of the Modi Shah BJP because they are not the fount of the crisis. Uh, you had written that in one of your columns. So when people are looking at this election result as a, as a harbinger of hope, and you're saying, look, I mean, you can get rid of these guys tomorrow or next year or whatever, nothing is going to change. Why do you say that? How are you seeing this scenario? Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming in. It's so heartening to see you all. Good evening to you all. And uh, I must say what uh, Madam Vidya has omitted to say is that I am her student. She teaches me French. <laughs> I don't know why she omit omitted it. Maybe it just slipped out of her mind. Uh, Prem, coming back to your question, it's very heartening that um, yesterday's result went against the um, Modi Shah BJP. And uh, the people of Karnataka, on the whole, elected uh, Congress as an alternative. But as I said, uh, it's not an occasion for uh, too much of a celebration. Because you know, the, the crisis is not simply electoral. The, it, the question goes much deeper the issue goes much deeper. How did we land here? Why did we land here? And what is it that we face today? What kind of a crisis the Republic is facing? Not just Karnataka, not just uh, you know, UP, not just a couple of uh, states, uh, a bunch of states. Now, I'm, I don't have uh, the latest and authentic figures yet. But overall, if you look at Karnataka results, the coastal Karnataka has not changed much. Bangalore city has not changed much. Uh, 
there's a bit of adjustment here and there, number one. The second most important is that you see, even in 2018, the mandate was not for the BJP. So you have replaced a government, but you have not substantially changed the 2018 mandate overall. That brings me to the core point, is that the electoral battle, winning an electoral battle or losing an electoral battle, even if you win the electoral battle, not now, even 2024, the challenge will not really go away because the challenge has been built assiduously over a long period of time, over the years, away from the electoral politics, away from the limelight, or away from the news cycles and the headlines, quietly working with a huge cadre which works in order to instill communal hate poison in the minds of the people. Now, an electoral victory probably makes the job easier. I'm not saying, I'm not denying that. But it doesn't really take the problem away. Because what you need to do is, in the long run, over the years, it might take a decade or even more, to completely excise that, that communal hate, the divisive mentality from a large and influential section of our population and our electorate. That is the challenge. That is the reason why, although I'm, I'm a bit happy that, you know, there is, uh, there is there's a change of government and there is uh, some kind of a defeat to, you know, the, 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 the kind of uh, publicity, the kind of propaganda, the kind of, uh, you know, campaign that was carried here, all that is fine. But then the, the serious, much more serious problem remains. Uh, when you said a decade, hopefully, to erase this, were you saying a decade after this regime, or if and when this regime is over, or are you saying a decade from now? No. After, if and when this regime ends, from then, maybe a decade or even more, and only if the political forces and the political platforms, or even civil society platforms, understand the challenge, size up the challenge, and then don't become complacent, yes, you know, we have, we have defeated and we have won the electoral battle. If they don't get complacent and don't, uh, you know, uh, rest on the uh, laurels, but continue to work to instill the republic's core and founding values of diversity, secularism, tolerance, democracy. That has to be done. If that is not done, one electoral victory is not going to make much of a difference. If not 2024, 2029, you can't wish this away. I'm sorry, I probably, you know, I'm, I'm dampening the kind of, you know, high spirits people have. But this is, this is the reality. You see, uh, Prem, if you allow me, I'll, I'll add a couple of more sentences to this. You know, when 2009, you know, Atal Bihari Vajpayee's government lost and, you know, UPA government uh, was in place in, in Delhi, in central government. And then 2009, again, that, 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 that formation returned to power. You know, all the political formations that are wedded to the core and founding ideals of the Indian Republic thought, there's no challenge for it, you know. We have a fine. You know, Indian polity now is a contest between center-right, which is BJP, NDA, etc., and center-left, which is Congress, UPA, etc. That's it, you know, it's not going to be uh, an extreme right or an extreme left, but you know, it's somewhere going to be around, and 
BJP probably is is themed enough. It's it's it, it, you know it, it, it's not going to talk about Hindutva. It, remember, I will of course we'll have occasion to talk about it. BJP always used to talk about secularism. It used to say we are also secular, but we are genuinely secular, not like those you know people who talk about secularism but appease. We are not that. We are genuinely secular. Now from that, today, those who are opposed to BJP or the Modi Shah party today, they say, look, we are also Hindu, but not like you. When BJP used to say that we are secular, but not like you, today, from there, the conversation has come to, we are also Hindu. We also say Bajrang Bali, well, well we, we, we worship Hanuman, but not like you. Look at the look at the way the narrat narrative has changed. The conversation has changed, and that is no mean achievement. It's a huge one. Of course, we'll have occasion to elaborate on these things. Uh, yeah, um, like you said, there's plenty right there to unpack, and we can take the entire session and do it. But considering the breadth and the scope of your book, I thought maybe move on to another subject that is uh, that you're very vehement about and which is very uh, close to your heart, your training, your inclination, your profession as an economist, which is the state of the Indian economy. Um, you brought up UPA. So generally, the consensus seems to be that UPA, one, managed the economy fairly decently. Yeah, they could have done more than they did, but overall, not a bad job, which is why they got re-elected. Uh, UPA 2, the first couple of years, fairly decent. And then Anna Hazare started his uh, campaign first against Loka Yukta, I think in July 2011, at which point uh, the government overreacted, went into panic mode, and there was a paralysis. Now, in your, uh, in, in more than one essay, you've talked about the mismanagement of the economy. And in one place, you've said that it is staggeringly Bad. Incompetent. Incompetent. Incompetent, yes. yeah. yeah. Uh, staggeringly incompetent is the word you used, correct. Uh, you said that economic theory has been replaced by voodoo economics. Uh, my question is twofold. One, is what is happening to the economy today a sort of, let's say the slide started towards the end of UPA2 and then accelerated during the BJP regime, Modisha's uh, 2014 onwards, or is there some kind of something that you are seeing that the layperson doesn't see, which shows the economy really getting badly hit post 2014? Prem, let me preface this uh, answer with a couple of observations. One, although the BJP, the present government, and the Modisha regime you know, talks about, you know, we we are very strong. Our fundamentals are very strong. We are managing the economy very well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The scene is very bad. I'll come to that. But then, that is only to put you off scent. Because you see, they they are not. This regime is not claiming its legitimacy. It it doesn't. Its power doesn't rest on its economic performance, its record of, uh, say, freedom or liberalism or constitutional values or anything. No, it, it doesn't rest. Let's, 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 not, let's not fool ourselves. Be very careful. Now, if you go on, you see, I, I, I do not know about the particular context of Karnataka. What the person Sarkara must have yielded some, uh, you know, dividends and all that. But tomorrow, if you tell the public, look, this guy, or these people, this is the kind of unemployment, this is the kind of price rise, this is the kind of labor participation ratio, this is the kind of women participation in the labor force, you know, this is the productivity, this is the um, wholesale price index, this is retail price index, consumer price index, food inflation is this much, inflation is this much, RBI is saying is 6%, but now it is 6.5% or 7%, etc., etc. You read up all this. 
it's not going to cut much eyes and they know it all this is you know uh, um, our disinvestment you know our, our or uh, record in uh, managing the economy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is is not very material to them. The power, the electability of this regime, Modi Shah regime, rests on Hindutva, Hindi, and one country, you know, uh, one hall. One country, one book. One country, uh, one language. One country, one party. One country, something. You know, all that. It is that. So if you if you if you bark at them, look, what is the inflation? What is the unemployment? What is the labor participation ratio? What is what is women? What is uh, youth employment? Unemployment? No, it's not going to cut. You know, they'll go on answering it because they know very well. Look. When, immediately after, when hundreds and hundreds of dead bodies floated in the, in, in the Ganges, people were dying for lack of oxygen, cylinders, hospital beds. A government returns. A government returns after dem any Any normal government would have been, you know, absolutely roundly defeated. You, 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 it's just unimaginable that it returned because it is not being made accountable to hospitals, cylinders, beds, inflation, price rise, unemployment, any of these. No, it's not that. So there's a core, there's a core issue, there's a core, uh, uh, you know, uh, basis on, on which uh, foundation on which the power of this particular regime rests. Each regime has a basis for its power to rest. Anywhere, anywhere across the world, in any society. What is it? We have to identify on what does it rest. This particular regime, what does it rest on? You have to understand that. Try and address that. All others, they don't matter. They just laugh their way to the, the electoral bank, you know. Which is interesting, particularly that part where you talked about why people vote for this party. But I want to circle back to the core question. As a lay person, I get a sense that all is not well with the economy. I can think a little bit, look at a little bit of data, and probably extrapolate and say, OK, uh, this doesn't seem to be working, that is stressed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But since there is a professional economist on stage, what I was looking for from you is, could you possibly talk to the state of the economy in a way the majority of us can understand and tell us exactly what is wrong? Where are we at today? How did we get there? And what will it take to recover? Because clearly recovery is necessary. Let us first understand, or let us first, uh, let me first say that the BJP, not only today, but since its inception, that is 1980, it has no coherent economic philosophy. Let's keep that in mind, first of all. Ram Goha, you would remember, when BJP was founded, its economic creed was Gandhian socialism. Gandhian socialism. That's what the Bombay adhivation of the Bharati Janata Party in 1980 talked about, which quietly, without much announcement, is just removed. Then they opposed Prem. 1991 reforms of Narasimha Rao. They were dead against it. But they implemented it later on, you know, when they came to power. Now, it's interesting to see that, you know, there is 
no consistent economic thinking in the BJP. That's one. What does it say about privatization? What did it, what did it say before and what is it saying now? What did it say about disinvestment and what is it saying now? During Arun Shaori, during Arun Jetli, and now, you know, very different. What did it say during Narasimhara? Very different. What did it say in 1980? It's very different. But it goes on. So there's no consistent economic philosophy. One. Now, coming now down to the present state of the economy. You are asking me for figures. Prem, you know, as well as I know, that the government doesn't give you any figures anymore. Very difficult to get even a single figure from the government. It, therefore, you need to rely on the private data providers, like the CMIE, et cetera, et cetera. They're fairly good, fairly authentic. So the unemployment rate hovers around somewhere around 8% today. Youth unemployment, which is, which is much more important than general unemployment. Youth unemployment is somewhere over 20%. 20%. Now, there are about more than between, you know, roughly, not less than two crores, but between two crores and three crores of people have got out of agriculture. It's just not possible for them to sustain themselves in the, in the sector. This is what is happening. Then the food inflation is high, around 7%. I'm talking about monthly averages. You know, this week, you know, suddenly the, the, the pink papers cry, you know, saying that, you know, it's 4.3%. It's, 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 it's very low compared to the last three months or four months. But then the week, week on week. But then if you look at the overall monthly figures, you will get a figure of about 7%, which is much more than the RBI's um, Tolerant, tolerance limit, that's what. That itself is high, but still it's higher than the RBI's, you know, uh, limit. Then quarter by quarter, if you have a look at it, last quarter, about 20 million salary jobs have been lost in the Indian economy. Female participation in the labor force has come down, and it has been coming down. As I, I told you about the youth unemployment. This is the state of affairs. And you know, before the pandemic struck us, the economy was in a slowdown. Pandemic worked havoc, played havoc with the economy. And you had a quarter which showed us 27% negative growth. Now today, the Indian economy has not gone back to its pre-pandemic stage. Not yet. But then, the government and the government uh, ministers and spokespersons and those who support the government and the ruling party, they tell us, you know, we are fastest growing economy, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's something called uh, a low base effect. Now, if you are minus 10, and then you have grown by a little, then, you know, it, 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 because you're coming down from, because you say, I do, I do not know, you know, generally, to, to make you understand a, a, a bit more clearly, even for a lay person, have you seen any developing country grow by more than 2%, 3%? They all grow. America grows, Britain grows, France grows. You know, all these economies grow at 1.8%, 2%, 2.2%. And then, if one, one point, 
I mean, 1.8 percent. If the if the if the if the if the forecast is two percent, if it grows by 1.8 percent, they're all alarmed. You know, 0.2 percent for us it makes no difference at all because we are such a low base. It makes no difference. I mean, we 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 don't get alarmed about it. But those economists, because they are already at a, an advanced stage. Now, if you tell me, look, America is growing only at, at 1.8% 1, 1 or 2%, I'm growing at 5%. I'm so great. No, it's not that. Because you, have, you, have, you are operating at a very, very low base. So let us not get carried away or let's not get uh, misled by these kind of, uh, you know, um, um, statements and, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, propaganda and the publicity that, that is put out. But as I, as I told you, when you look at the uh, wholesale price index, you look at the consumer price index, when you, when you look at the rate of inflation, when you look at the food inflation, when you look at the uh, unemployment rate, when you look at especially the youth unemployment, when you look at the uh, labor participation ratio, when you look at the uh, female participation ratio, labor, part, labor force in the labor force, female participation in the labor force, all these indicators are giving us concern. Now, you might ask me, is it so bad? It is bad, but we are still able to get on and on and on. That is the strength of India. Not because of the government, not because of the policies of the government, because in spite of the government, the economy is somewhere along the lines. It's, it's just going on. No. I just make one more point, uh, Prem. The government tells us that people are unwilling to see the green shoots. We are not, nobody is unwilling to see the green shoots. We are all happy. But you see, when you go to a doctor, he'll have to tell you, look, you have a problem with your heart. He won't start by saying that, you know, your eyes are good, your ears are good, your legs are OK, yeah? your liver is also functioning well, your nose, your sense of smell is pretty good, your taste is nice. All you know, good things he, he tells you, and then says, "Look, your heart is bad." Uh, no, it, it doesn't happen that way. A diagnosis is that look, this is the problem. There is a problem here. Look at it. Now, if I if I go to the doctor and say, "Look, all so many things are so good. Why don't you talk about them? Why are you only talking about my heart?" I have no answer to that. But I think my job is to say that look, there is a problem. There's a serious problem. Look at that. Well, there are, there are so many good things. There are so many good things, that is the reason why you could come here and talk to me. Otherwise, you, probably I would have you know, come to, you know, to, to, the, to the crematorium or somewhere to, to see you. But that's not happened. That's not happened. That is the reason why you need to take care of this. And it won't happen. Yeah, oh, I, I, I could fill in uh, what you wanted. Yeah. I was a bit nervous when he kept pointing at me and saying my heart is bad, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, basically, I mean, just to add to what Dr. Prabhakar was saying, look at it this way. Today, I saw in the newspapers that the government has added an amendment to the finance bill uh, to the effect that Every time you use your credit card for a foreign transaction from now on, and that includes even subscribing to newspapers, magazines, etc., you've got a 20% TCS added on. Uh, don't look at that in isolation. Look at that in context of all the taxes. So one of the things that we keep hearing, the positive shoots that uh, we've heard so much about, the green shoots, GST collection up by a record number this month or this quarter. It's logic. If there is inflation, if prices are rising month on month, if you buy the exact same things this month as you bought last month, you're paying more, therefore you're getting, the government is getting more in terms of taxes. Effectively, what the government is telling us with all these new taxes that they're adding is that they have run Sorry out of money. Sorry to interrupt you, Prem, one minute. 
Now, if the government tells me, look, my revenue has increased, therefore the economy is good, that's one. If the government tells me, Prem, your income has increased, that means the economy is good, yeah. then that's more convincing to me. Not that your income, but my income, my standard of living, yeah. you know? Correct. Exactly my, my problem. Mine hasn't increased. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we could keep talking about the economy, and that's uh, Dr. Prabhakar's uh, area of expertise, but the book encompasses a whole lot of other things as well. And if you look at the title of the book, The Crooked Timbers, the timbers that Dr. Prabhakar is referring to are the institutions that hold up the roof of democracy. You're talking of, start with the judiciary. You're talking of the administration, the bureaucracy, uh, the IAS. Uh, you're talking of the IFS. You're talking of the police. You're talking of the uh, armed forces. You're talking of huh, the media. Uh, these are the timbers. And, and in essay after essay, the point that Dr. Uh, Prabhakar makes is that these timbers are now termite ridden. The roof is collapsing. Basically, it's a, it's a Samson pulling the roof down kind of scenario. Um, I wanted him to talk about it. And just to frame it in context, look at what is actually happening to institutions. Again, we are less than 24 hours after we knew what happened in Karnataka in the elections. We have a body called the Election Commission of India. It is supposed to be an independent body. Once the dates are proclaimed, the Election Commission takes over. And from then on, it dictates the terms. There are norms of behavior. What happened in Karnataka? The, the first thing that you notice is that on the 27th of February, when the campaign of the BJP officially kicked, over, uh, kick, kicked off, it kicked off with an event in Shimoga. The Karnataka government gazette says that it spent 35.36 crore for Modi to inaugurate an airport in Shivmoga. Hawaii chappal pehne wala aaj Hawaii jaaz mein ja sakta hai. That's what he said. Uh, fun fact, from 27th of February till right now this minute, not a single flight has either landed in or taken off from Shivmoga. Not one. Hawaii chappal pehne wala aaj bhi raste pe chal raha hai, kahi Hawaii jaaz nahi mil raha usko. But that aside, the point is, if you think back to Raj Narayan versus Indira Gandhi, the famous case, the Allahabad High Court, the reason why Indira Gandhi's election was set aside was because she used the administration, specifically the DYSP and the district uh, magistrate, to help organize the rally. Here you have the entire government being used. It violates electoral norms and is cause for disqualification. Nobody even talks about it. Campaigning in Karnataka ended on the eighth evening. On the ninth morning, Modi makes a, an appeal to the voters of Karnataka via video, which is widely disseminated by electronic media and through social media. It is in defiance of the norms. Modi then holds a road show in Rajasthan on the same day which is widely televised, televised again. It is an appeal for votes. And if you really believe that that is because of the Rajasthan election, I have a bridge to sell you because the Rajasthan election is due only in December. Even the BJP wouldn't start its campaign this early. It wouldn't do a road show this early. That was meant for Karnataka. What you have is two things here. One an utter, absolute, blatant contempt for every single institution, and two, an utter failure on the part of the various institutions to hold the government to account. Uh, I think, basically, what I wanted to ask you is, you made that the central premise of your book, even though, basically, you talk a lot about the economy. You're not just talking about the economy. You're talking about what is happening to the institutions. And I've been curious about this. Today, all of this seems very stark, very in your face. How the hell did I not see it? But it didn't happen overnight. The question is, what were we missing all these years? What did we not see? And having gotten to this point, is there a way out? Is there a way of, of 
straightening these timbers that you, you argue convincingly are crooked? You know, uh, I subtitled the book as Essays on the Crisis of the Republic. Essays, uh, essays on a Republican crisis. That is the subtitle. Most people wonder, what crisis is he talking about? Where is the crisis? I think it's Neville Chamberlain or somebody. Crisis, what crisis? But there is a crisis. Why do I see that there is a crisis? Of course, uh, whatever uh, Prem had already said, I'll add a few points to that. I've already referred to you know, something earlier. You know, we have moved away, very far away, from the founding ideals and values of our republic. Did it happen overnight? It did not happen overnight. And I also, you know, uh, briefly mentioned about what used to be the, the political discourse. The political discourse used to be, the central point of the political discourse used to be secularism. For a long time, frame, the BJP did not reject secularism. It said, we are also secular, as I said. We are also secular. What are you talking about? We are all secular. In fact, being a Hindu itself is secular. We are Hindu and we are therefore secular. Sarva dharma sambhav, you know. Only matabhed, not much. And, you know, ekam uh, sat. But, you know, the the um, the expo people who who expound they might you know have different paths to that particular sat particular truth we are tolerable we are, we are we are tolerant that kind of a thing used to be the thing and for a long time the BJP suffered what they themselves used to call political untouchability. I don't know if how many people remember, used to remember, remember that. Uh, Lal Krishna Advani used to say that, look, there should not be political untouchability in this country. We are as legitimate as you are. We, we are also, you know, we have a rightful place at the table. Why are you, why are you not touching us? Why do you say that, you know, we, we should be away? No, we are not. We are, we. They used to fight political untouchability. And they used to go on saying that we are also uh, uh, secular. And today, I don't know how many of you have noticed this. The BJP, Modi Shah BJP Parliamentary Party has not a single member. There is no member of parliament a, an entire parliamentary party, uh, Raj Sabha as well as Lok Sabha of BJP today. And in many states, especially UP and, and Gujarat, there is not a single MLA. Minority. Sorry? Minority MLA. MLA, Muslim MLA, sorry, Muslim MLA. Muslim, not a single Muslim MLA. Yeah, that's the. Rubric. You know, not only that, there is no single Muslim MLA. Not a single Muslim was given an MLA ticket at all. Whether they win or lose it different, is a different thing. And for Lok Sabha, you know, they, they, they couldn't help but giving six tickets. Two in Jammu and Kashmir, one in, uh, you know, uh, Lakshadweep and one in some place, etc. But all of them lost. They're not very, you know, uncomfortable and unhappy about it in any way. So therefore, you, you end up having no MP and no MLA in the places where they have consolidated their power. BJP's formulation used to be, look, there, is, there are three ways of dealing with 
Muslims in this country. One is Tiraskar. You reject them. That's not possible. That's what earlier BJP used to say. It's not possible because, you see, they're, they're, they're part of us. There's so many of them. The other one is Puraskar, which Congress is doing. You know, they're appeasing them. They're, they you know, garlanding them. They're facilitating them, felicitating them. They're giving them, uh, you know, um, making them presidents and vice presidents and speakers and ministers and all that. You're appeasing them. We are not for that because we are genuine secular. The third one is samskar. You you reform them in such a way that they 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 content themselves to being you know under you second class they don't mind you know, that kind of thing so you you tame them but today it's not puraskar anyway it is not even samskar it is tiraskar so it has come to that now and how did the discourse change as i said you know I, I i keep when i keep reading newspapers very prominent columnists not ram guha but very prominent columnists i don't want to name them one of them i can tell you not the name but the content you will probably some of you who have read that will understand that person writes very prominent one that person writes, once in a year, on that particular, before that particular festival, I fast for nine days. And I go to such and such temples. I do these, these, these pujas. Yet, you know, I am not for this. So, everybody is now trying to establish their Hindu credentials in order to say that, look, this is not the thing that I want. It wasn't the case before. When did this start? This, this started after the Ram Janmabhoomi movement picked up. Now, when did this manifest? And slowly, you know, a, a, a very, very fiery chief minister of one of the states. She goes to, you know, Durga Puja Pandals in order to establish that, look, I'm also, why not? You're not the only one, I'm also. This started manifesting in these things and the genesis, as far as I remember, probably, you know, you, you can go back even further, I do not know, but 89, Rajiv Gandhi inaugurates his election campaign in Ayodhya. What are you doing there? Aren't you, uh, you are not standing up and saying, look, this is not the narrative. But something else is the narrative. This country is for everybody. And I am for that. I don't mind being defeated. OK, I, 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 I or you know, people who, who, who think that India is for everybody will go and convince people. But that was not to be, unfortunately. They wanted to, you know, fight for the Hindu pie, a part of it, one. The second thing is that after the, after the Babri Masjid movement, when the BJP from two, it went on to, you know, add seats, from you know each and every state, especially in the in the indo gangetic plane, for opportunistic reasons, many political parties they don't they don't have they are not ideologically you know uh, 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 akin to the BJP, but when the BJP wanted numbers, they were more than willing to provide those numbers in order to get a couple of cabinet berths there or a speaker's position or something else, a few governors for their friends, you know, something like that. So people, political parties, platforms, which are, are supposedly upholding or nearer to the 
founding values of our republic, started doing business with BJP on thinking that, you know, they're idiots. We can fool them and we can get something out of it. No, it's not that. It's, it's the last laugh is the BJPs, isn't it? So that is where, that is how progressively we landed here in this place. And in the background, when your two windows are open, you know, all your other apps are also in the background, they're working. Those apps, they started working in, you know, the forests of Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, you know, uh, they don't fight elections. They, they, you know, the broad spectrum of, you know, organizations. You'd be surprised. You, you like Sanskrit? What for BJP? You like Bajrangbali? What for BJP? Nothing to do with, you know, what is Sanskrit and what is BJP? There's nothing. But then there are organizations who are working to show, to tell you that, you know, in order to, in order to see that Sanskrit flourishes, this regime has to be elected. And from there, you know, a very sophisticated Sanskrit lover to a cow vigilante, you know, the most ruffian you can imagine. That is the kind of spectrum, broad spectrum antibiotic this is. That is the kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, width that these people could slowly and gradually Absolutely, you know, hundreds and thousands of people with no electoral ambitions. Hundreds and thousands of people who do not want to do something today and look up the newspaper tomorrow, is my photograph there in it? No. That, 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 there's a card like that. Don't underestimate the strength. Today, why we landed here is not because of just Modi or Shah or you know, a couple of other people, no. It is this. It is sharpened by them, that's a different thing. The benefits are reaped by them, that's a different thing. That is the chehra, that's a different thing. That's the face, that's a different thing. All that is fine. But then the grunt work, the core work was done by these away from the limelight. And slowly and slowly the narrative has changed from secular to Hindu. If you allow me, I'll, 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 I'll just uh, mention a small uh, incident, you know, in my, in my life. You know, I, I, I have a, recently I've, I've, I've recruited a driver for myself, young fellow who came from Rayal Seema, a little boy. He was not exposed to a town or he's not exposed politically or whatever. And because he is new to Hyderabad city, I told him that, look, we have to go there. Uh, you know, type it in your Google Maps app. He did that. I did it and gave it to him. And Google Maps, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, in, uh, to save your time or, you know, to, to take you by the nearest route, you know, where there is not much of a traffic, it takes you into little, little gullies, small, small streets. And in Hyderabad, small streets, normally, you know, you have huge Muslim population. Don't mind me saying this. This boy, we were driving, you know, in a very narrow street. This boy says, Sir, these Muslims, they are not giving way. What is this? Where did he get this? How did he get this? Why did he say this? I was surprised. You know, it's a small lane, people are walking. Where will they walk? They have to walk on the road. There are no payments. I mean, there are no payments anywhere in the country anyway. That's a different thing. But in a, in a, in a narrow street, you, have, you hardly have space for people to walk around. They walk around as if, you know, they're walking, walking around in their own veranda. It happens. Even Bangalore people do that. Even in MG Road people do that. But this man immediately says, look, look at these Muslim fellows. You know, they are, they're not giving way. They're walking on the road as if it's theirs. Where did, where, did, where, where did this come about? 
this has come about. And you know, internationally, nationally, you can say, look, you know, uh, Osama bin Laden, ISIS, and then Bombay blasts and things like that, Hyderabad um, blasts and all that. All that, fine, that's fine. But then there is some kind of a work that has gone into this to prepare a lot of people mentally. There is already a poison without you and me knowing it around us. Maybe in me, maybe in you also, we do not know. So it has, it has worked to that extent. It's not one day's job. It's not just one victory of an election, one election, one state election, one national election, no. It, it, it is there, it's been happening, it's been happening. And if you notice, they made no secret about this. I remember, I remember one of the very prominent ideologues of the BJP once upon a time. He said, this Vajpayee is a mukhota for us. You know, we, we just, it's just a, what do you call mukhota? Mask, he's a mask, you know. But we have a, a different agenda. Because now he's acceptable to people like you, we're putting him. Don't be fooled by this. That's why he said that. Don't, don't find fault. I mean, it's not all that stealth, but there is stealth also. For instance, look at uh, Prem, if I may take one more minute. Look at the 2014 election campaign. 2014 election campaign was not about CAA. It was not about, uh, you know, Article 370. It's not about hijab. It's not about Tipu Sultan here. It's not about any of these. You know what it is about? It is about clean government. It's about corruption-free government. It's about economic growth, Gujarat model. You know, the whole country would, you know, vibrate like Gujarat. I don't know what that is, but. It, 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 it would vibrate like Gujarat. And there'll be milk and honey flowing in UP and Bihar, you know, in all these places. <laughs> and what is this? The fight is not between Muslim and Hindu. No. Are you, I, I, don't you know that? No, it, it's, it's, it's a great country. It's not, the fight is not between Hindu and Muslim. It is a fight between unemployment and poverty on the one side and Hindus and Muslims on the other side together. Both Muslim and Hindu together would fight poverty and unemployment. That is the agenda. That is why you vote for Kamal. Not, for, not against Tip Sultan, not against, you know, you know, massacre of Iyengars somewhere. No, it's not that. It's not 370. It's not CAA. It's not against Pakistan. It's for that. So there is stealth also. But there are some people who would very candidly tell you, look, all this is just tamasha. Don't get taken away by this. All right. We, we, will, do, we will keep doing this, but we have a different agenda. In one word, it's been building up and, and the so-called platforms which are wedded to the founding values and principles uh, ideals of our republic were sleepwalking from one election to the other. When they win an election, they think, yeah, look, we have won. We defeated. No. You have not defeated anything. Because, you see, politics is not in isolation. It's not in a vacuum. Politics is an outcome of what happens in the society. Politics is, what, you know, is an outcome of what happens in the economy. So much so, today, where is this narrative most popular? This narrative is most popular in urban areas. This narrative is most popular, most acceptable in IIMs, IIM alumni, IITs, IIT alumni, people who are working for, you know, Huge multinational corporations, people, doctors, advocates, people who who used to be, uh, sometime before, used to be the leaders, thought leaders, of our society.
Now today, except you know people like Ram Guha and a few others, we have outsourced our thought leadership to TV studios. Somebody who shouts, "Look, you know, that is he is the thought leader. They are the thought leaders. They tell you what to think before you sleep." And you know, after that, you switch it off and sleep. And you know, that goes on. And morning, you get up and say, "Look at these Muslims." <laughs> People are not looking at you know uh, universities, professors, or political leaders, or vagayakaras, uh, or you know, uh, or cultural icons. They are not looking at them. They are looking at at nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, you make two people sit there and you know, trash each other. And, and then you conclude. So this is the, is, the, is the slow growth of this. And it needed patience, and they had patience. None of us have patience. They want, we want elections tomorrow. And this government should fall, and tomorrow we should come into power. And when you come into power, and you do all sorts of things. And then you get defeated. And you, 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 you just don't understand why you got defeated and why you got elected. You don't understand. You don't want to take any lesson from not just defeat. I mean, defeat, anyway, people will, will start thinking about what, what, why, 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 why are we defeated. I want political parties and political platforms to take lessons from victories. Why did we win? How did we win? Why did we win from the, with this margin? Why didn't we win? Why did we win there? And did we win well? Or did we just, you know, just pass the post? That's all. We, that, there, is, there is a need for it. Yeah, just to. Uh add a little bit more to what uh, Dr. Prabhakar was saying. Um, when you talk of quiet, unnoticed work, the RSS has had a project that has been decades in the making. What they have been basically doing is taking young, smart young boys and girls, funding them through schools, colleges, getting them into you know, the professional courses, getting them into the IAS, into the IFS, into the police forces, uh, into the legal profession, where they slowly grew up to become baby judges and then senior judges. I don't want to alarm the hell out of you, but in about less than a decade from now, there is a judge who's going to be judge of the Supreme Court for a period of about six years, a little over six years. It will become the longest serving chief justice. If you remember Arun Mishra, this guy makes Arun Mishra look like a kindergarten kid. Uh, that is the subsurface uh, activity that Dr. Prabhakar was referring to, and that explains what is happening to our institutions. Uh, I used the word termite written a while ago. The problem is it is infiltration. It is infiltration and a gradual takeover to a point where you get to this place where it doesn't matter who's in power anymore because you control all the levers, including the media. Um, we've been talking about you know, how many things are going wrong with the country. One of the problems is you can look at individual symptoms, but the overarching symptom is there is a lack of ideology. Ideology has been replaced by a cult. It is now officially the cult of Modi. And the question I have for you, you've actually written about this. You've written about the cult of personality and the uh, consequent uh, ill effects of that. What happens when this cult is no more? When this cult is no more? No more. Yeah. That's very interesting. Again, I would, no. I would be very cautious. Uh, when I said the cult is no more, please, I don't want to be arrested by the cops. I'm not suggesting. So I'll preemptively apologize and apply for bail? No, no. no. You, you're safe, Prem. <laughs> when the cult is not there, not the cult figure. The cult is not there. 
But you see, these are let's let's be let's 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 be a, a, a bit more careful here. These these are idiosyncrasies. Um, we might not like it, but there are some people who like it. Um, but that's not the core. The core is something else. The core that is being appealed to is very different. The core, as I said, you know, irrespective of any number of deaths, any number of uh, you know untoward incidents, um, you know, uh, it could be COVID, it could be joblessness. Look at the demonetization. If I do not know, you know, after the disastrous demonetization. And, and 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 the way it, it, it panned out, its its impact on uh, uh, unorganized sector, on small scale sector, you know, on uh, farmers, on you know, small employees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Large number of uh, people. Could any government really survive? Anywhere in the world, you know, people in the 60s and 70s and 80s, if you remember, some of you. They, the political parties and uh, the leaders in power, they used to decide on the election month after looking at the kind of monsoon. Is the monsoon okay? How, how are the rains? What kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, feeling the farmers have? If there are good rains, let's go for elections. You know, the people are going to vote for the ruling party. But if the if the if the rains are not good, then the ruling party invariably, most of the cases, the ruling parties used to lose. That used to be the uh, situation. People used to look at you know the, the the rain gods and also try to you know forecast the election results. They they they, they, they were years like that. But today. It could be disastrous demonetization, disastrous COVID management, rising unemployment, rising, you know, prices and all that, you know, beti padao, beti bachao, or beti bachao, beti padao, I do not know, one of, you know, uh, yeah, this way or that way. It doesn't matter. Yeah, matter. whichever. 79% huh? uh, of that fund is, you know, for holdings and other things, for publicity and all that. And uh, you know, girls are protesting in Jantar Mantar. We don't bother about it. Uh, then we have uh, you know, wonderful you know. Uh, I don't know who. There's very creative people who would say, "Make in India, stand up India, skill India, skill India. You know, run India." Jan Dhan, your jam. I used to, what is jam? Jan Dhan, uh, what is that? Jan Aadhar Mobile. Mobile, you know, Jan, uh, Jan Dhan account, mobile, uh, Aadhar and mobile. Jan, jam, jam trinity. Jam trinity, you know. All this kind of, and you, you see, left out we, two AB also, we used right? to have planning commission, and if, you know, if you don't get any figures anywhere, planning commission used to give us, you know, what is the employment, what is the unemployment, what is the kind of, you know, retail uh, prices and what wholesale prices, you know, CPI, WPI, etc., etc. We used to go to planning commission website or planning commission, uh, you know, and look at the plan document. Plan document used to give a huge amount of data for us. You know, uh, for, uh, we take fifth, a planning commission's document, you can write 15 papers out of it, you know. <laughs> Today, we have what is called Niti Ayog. You know what is Niti Ayog? What is it? National Institution for Transforming India. Now, it's, it's now almost about nine years now. Give me one idea which has the potential to transform India from that. They are talking about, you know, uh, electric vehicles, the future of, future of, future of cars in India. You go to their website, there are, there are, there are papers published. Nothing to do with, uh, and then doubling of farmers income. That's one of the papers written by them. Doubling of farmers income, uh, you know, by this year, today. 
22. Okay, 22. Now, but, you know, on the one hand, doubling of farmers' income is, is a slogan. Skill India is a slogan. Stand up India is a slogan. You know, sprint India is a slogan. Something else is a slogan. Something. Swachh Bharat. And I, you know, we have a, a five camera setup to, you know, when, when you pick up those plastic bags from um, Mamalpuram Beach or something like that. Hmm? No, my point was, you know, who, who threw that, first of all? Why did you throw that? <laughs> okay, and I, I don't want my prime minister to pick up those things. Uh, my, I don't want my PM to do that. Even if it is, you know, a five camp set up also, it doesn't look nice to do that. So, uh, innovative ideas. That brings me to all this is the cult. But the programs are these. They, 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 you know, uh, it, 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 gives, it brings me to my mind uh, an image of a rocket launch. A rocket is launched, and after it goes up a little bit, then it sheds. Then it goes up a little further, and it sheds something else. But the payload remains. Actually, all these are in order to see that the payload is put in the orbit. What is the payload here? Payload is Hindutva. All this Stand Up India, Skill India, uh, Jandhan Yojana, etc., etc., they're all payloads. You know, they, they, they're just, you know, uh, one, one evening, one event, gala event, next day morning, huge headlines. After that, nothing. Now, I'm not saying this just like that, you know, in order to uh, get some laughs or claps from you. No, not that. You know, I was quite serious because these have the potential to transform India, really, if, if they are really implemented, honestly. But none of the ministries, because every ministry tables their annual report in parliament. Not a single ministry, whether it is Skill India, whether it is Stand Up India, whether it is Make in India, you know, the concerned ministries, they don't talk anything about it, not a word about these things in their annual reports. What have they achieved? Because, and the Prime Minister also doesn't talk about these things in his independent state addresses. He talks about, he talks about partition, you know, what is it called? Vibhajan, uh, you know, the, the kind of... Uh, partition Remembrance Day. Partition Remembrance Day. Horrors Remembrance Day. Horrors Remembrance Day. Horror. So now, after 75 years, you know, he wants to summon those, you know, horrors and then put that kind of a hemlock and put that kind of a poison to the binds. And then, and at the same time, look at the contradiction. He, he calls it Amritkal. <laughs> Amritkal and, you know, hemlock on the, on the other side. What, do you, what, what does he want us to remember? He wants us to remember the visham, or the, the poison of partition. And, you know, we are entering the Amritkal. We are going from now onwards, next 25 years. Um, I don't know if you're going to ask me, but I want to, you know, I have one, one point that I want to make it, you know, after whatever uh, no, no. Uh, remarks that you make. I want this because, you know, you have tolerated us so long. Thank you very much. Um, that means that you're quite serious about this. Um, since we have come this far, I want to make one appeal to you, that is, we are celebrating 75 years of our independence. Azadi ka Amrit Mahotsav. The government, of course, it does that. It's very good at that. It's become a huge event manager. They're eventifying everything. 
and uh, you know, so many marches and things like that, and you know, some speeches and all that. But what we should do is very quietly keep our heads down and examine what has been our journey of 75 years like. We need to introspect. We need to take a critical look at it. 75 years. I mean, thumping of chest and clapping. That's not, that's not, that's not the thing. Let, let the political class do that. But civil society seriously should think about what, how is our political system? How are our legislatures? How is our executive? How is our judiciary? You were all elected recently. Who did you elect? Did you elect a legislator for your constituency? You did not. You did not. You did not make a candidate or a sitting MLA accountable for what he did in the legislative assembly. You might say, look, what happened to my Nala, what happened to my road, what happened to my you know, school, what happened to the hospital, what cover, all that. It's not his job. But you are making him think that that is his job. Not to you know, talk about a bill, not to talk about an act, not to talk about uh, a legislation. No, you're not making him accountable for that. You are making him accountable for, making him or her accountable for an executive job. Now, therefore, you are, we are electing executive in the, in the disguise of legislators. Aren't we? Think about it. Why did we, co why did we come to this? Should we continue with this kind of a thing? Or should we make a legislator's job a le legislation? Now, if, if, you know, I'm sure, you know, maybe in polite society you won't talk about it, but there are, there are constituencies and there are parties, there are candidates who would give you 2,000 rupees, 3,000 rupees per vote. Am I right? Why is the harsh silence? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Yeah, TVs and then cookers and scooters and you know so many things. Why? Because in order to become a minister, you need to become a legislator. So in order to be in the political executive, you need to be a legislature, part of the legislature. So there is no strict separation between. I'm not saying this as a solution. I'm just throwing up some ideas. Think about it. And if tomorrow, Prem says that no. Look, no legislator is going to be a minister. You can't become a minister. You can't become a part of the executive if you're a legislator. Your legislator means that you have to work, um, say, 250 days out of 365 days, you know, 10 hours, 12 hours, 15 hours a day, uh, six days a week, and, you know, discuss and debate the clauses and subclauses, clause A, clause B of a bill. You know, attend the legislature, you won't find people to file nominations. <laughs> Leave alone giving you 2,000 rupees, 4,000 rupees in scooters and all that, and bridges and all. No, they won't. They'll run away. You, you have to catch hold of Prem and say, please become a legislator. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, but we made it, we made the job of a legislator either very profitable or potentially very profitable. And potentially very profitable itself is, is, is a huge uh, incentive for people to spend money. We have to look at that. Then, I'll take what, two more minutes. I will win. I don't want to take too many, uh, your name too many times. I'll take Ram's name. <laughs> Okay. In the wrong context. Uh, you know, I will, I mean, Ram will be a member of parliament if he gets one vote more than I do, isn't it? And if there are 10 candidates, he need not get 51 votes. He needs to get 12 votes, and I get 11 votes, and he is the member of parliament. I want to extend this a bit more logically. 
Look, if there are, say, 223 in Karnataka, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's not a probability, it's a possibility. But that is the kind of system that we made. Now, if, two, if there are two keenly contested parties, and in every constituency, one party gets one vote more than the other party. Let's imagine for a while. So one party gets 223 votes more than the other party, but they have 100% seats for them in the legislature. Now you, you have the current regime with 38% of the vote, they are occupying 303 positions in, in, in the central legislature, isn't it? So what happens to those people, those, that party, which gets only 223 votes less than the other party? They're completely out of the house. Should that be? Is that a democracy? Is that a mother of democracy at least? N another one, another point, just one more point, I'll, 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 then I'll shut up. Um, see, I have, I have 100 supporters with me. But my 100 supporters are evenly spread across 100 constituencies. I get one vote from each constituency. And I'm nowhere. And Prem has only 50 votes in his support. But those 50 votes are in five constituencies. Then he has five seats in the, in the legislature. This is territoriality. Now, territorial constituency, first past the post system, you have the largest, it is not majority. Now, you see, all the political parties and all the political platforms are very cozy with this pre present arrangement because, you know, they, they go on saying that whatever it is, you see, he's got the mandate of the people. Where did he get the mandate of the people? Which government in India has got mandate of the people? Tell me. No, no political party. No government so far in India has got 51% mandate in this country. But they tell you, whatever it is, people have accepted him. People have given him mandate. People have not given him mandate. Only 35%, 35%, 36%, 38% at the, at the, at the post, 40% at the post. But 60%, 63%, 65%, 66% are not with you. You can't, re you can't represent them. You can't claim to represent them. This is another. So should we continue with this? I'm not saying that we should not continue with it. Maybe we could. But let's talk about this. Let's think about this. Let's debate this. This, this is an occasion. Let's, in, 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 in 20, 70, 60 year, you can't do that. 75th year, I don't know why. But 75, you, know, you need to, you can really you know, frame this. Think about this. Talk about this. Debate about this. And if necessary, and you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a society like, like ours, which has so many fault lines of, of caste, of, of religion, of language, of uh, you know, regionalism and all that, the, you know, coastal Karnataka goes to that party. Bangalore city goes to this party. Why? What is this? What happens to those people in the in coastal Karnataka who don't agree with that? What happened? Where, where is their voice represented? In the mother of democracy, tell me. So these are some of the thoughts. Anyway, I'll shut up now. So this, uh, uh, hang on, that's a bit premature. Uh, this mother of democracy thing reminds me, it's the only known instance in human history where the mother was born after the children. Uh, there have been lots of democracies before India became one, so. Um, but. See, I spent about an hour and a half, two hours yesterday with Dr. Prabhakar talking about the various issues in the book, and now we've spent another hour and a bit. And there's still a whole lot to unpack. What I would suggest is buy the book, read it. Oh, by the way, those of you who bought the book, I believe it's sold out outside. Those of you who bought the book can get it uh, signed after the after this in, in, in a few minutes. Um, that is all the housekeeping announcements. I think Sandhya... Uh, Audience questions? Uh, one or two audience questions, please. We have a time problem. That's three hands up already. OK, I'll start with a simple question. Um, given that we have a year to go for the next election, what should we be doing from now to then? You know, it's one thing to say 
yes, learn about the election, get educated, but what else? What can we do to feel like we're participating in making some change happen? What can you do, I think? Look, I mean, are you talking as an individual or as, a, as, a, as an individual? As an individual, I think it's conversations. Uh, one of the things that I've realized is we talk past each other too much. Uh, we've also formulated our positions. We are either this or that. Uh, but of late, of the last year, year and a half, I had multiple examples of this happening to me where people start out being, let's say, start out in a mood of conflict over something that I've said. And then I take a step back and say, okay, hang on, what are we disagreeing about? There has to be, like somebody said, I mean, you're entitled to your own opinion, not your own facts. So I just point out that, look, I mean, if we have a disagreement, Let's talk about what is that disagreement about. We leave the name calling aside. Yeah, I'm a pseudo intellectual, uh, libtard, whatever. Never mind that. Tell me what your disagreement is. We start. And then I say, OK, then how do you re reconcile your position with this set of facts? Explain it to me. It's sea lining in another sense. But what I do is I get into a conversation, and I find that more often than not, people say, yeah, I never thought of that before or some variant of that. The other thing is you don't have to belong to a political party to help a political party. That's something that I learned when I was a student activist. You can be part of the political process. Um, if there is a formulation that you, you find uh, appealing or a formulation that you want to work for, walk up to them and volunteer. There's always need for people. One of the things that the Karnataka election should have taught you is Everybody is looking at reasons why the Congress won. One of the single biggest reasons which is not talked about in the thing is the ground game. The fact that this time every single constituency had active workers working well before even the BJP started. You need hands. So these are simple things, but they add up and rope in more people. See, the thing is, we keep looking for that, OK, I want to fire this one magic bullet and solve the problem. It doesn't exist. Uh, but you work constantly over a period of time. I think if you talk to the people who ran the Congress campaign, they'll tell you just how far before this they have been actually working on this, working on the candidate. It's not a coincidence that Congress released its first and second list of candidates before the BJP did. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, sorry. The critique of Hindutva tends to be based on what is opposed to it, Consti um, constitutional values, secularism, etc. And while that critique is necessary, shouldn't we also be critiquing Hindutva on its own terms, that it is actually demeaning to Hindus because it predicates the faith on geography rather than spiritual practices and portrays its divinities as so emasculated, they need human protection. Very important question, I think. Um, I'm not very well, well versed in uh, Hindu philosophy and things like that. But Hindutva is different from Hindu. I know that. You know, I, I, I know it in my bones. You know. um, Hindutva, Hindutva, as defined by Savarkar, and and as as you know, being defined and put into practice today by the Sangh and Parivar organizations, etc. If you look at them, um, you don't have to be uh, a devout worshipping Hindu to be a Hindutvaadi, isn't it? Um, I, I do not know how many of you have really seen uh, Hindutvavadis going to Tirumala and waiting in the queue for 20 hours and 22 hours and 23 hours and getting a darshan for about a, a fleeting couple of seconds and coming out. No. 
And the originator of the doctrine of Hindutva was a declared, self-declared atheist, Veer Savarkar. Veer Savarkar is not a theist, he an atheist. So his formulation was, people whose uh, Matrubhumi and Punyabhumi happen to be India. This is a civilizational definition, etc., etc. But you see, if you start critiquing this from within the these parameters, now you are shifting the as I initially as I told you, you you are shifting the entire narrative in order to fight within that. The 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 arena is that. It is not secular arena that you are fighting. That is that that is that is it has its own role. You know, it could be from within, it could be from you know without, etc. But some section. But largely, largely the critique should be from outside, from a different value altogether. Um, as long as it is in those terms, the advantage is to the Hindutva, not you know the the, the other values. See what what puzzles me, Prem. I think I, I shared with uh, you probably yesterday, or uh, um, is that look? Look, you see, the, for the the kind of poison and the kind of you know um, exclusivity, the kind of uh, phobia that we see today, is actually immediately after partition was the most fertile ground for it. You know, massive dislocation. Dead bodies, you know, going by train from this side to the other side, and dead bodies coming from that side to this side. You know, people are not fighting individuals, but people are fighting religions. Six fighting Muslims. Ram Guha is, you know, in his Gandhi research and his books, he's very graphically told us what happened during those days. But you see, at that time, the leadership of this, of this particular school of thought, was very tall, far taller than what we have today. You know, you have, uh, uh, you had, uh, Mother Mohan, Mother Mohan. within the Congress also, you had a very strong constituency. Uh, Sadar Patel, Mother Mohan Malavia, et cetera, et cetera. Shama Prasad Mukherjee in the, in the BJS, you know, Karpatri Maharaj, then Balraj Madhok, people like that. They were much far, far more eminent people than, you know, what you see today. Still, that did not take off, that project did not take off. But the project did not die also. There was a project. That project did not die because, you know, a lot of people from the freedom movement who carried those value systems, they solidly stood against it and then fought it. Fought tooth and nail. In, 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 every, in, in every arena, it could be in history, it could be academics, it could be in economics, it could be in planning, it could be in you know reorganization of the Indian Republic. Should it be on the basis of uh, you know religion? Should it be on the basis of uh, region or language? You know, is it uh, you know size? You know, so many debates. I mean, sh what should be the plan like? You know, should it be giving more importance to you know industry or agriculture? You know, one in this, in one, one sector, this sector. You know, how much should be the allocations? So much of debate. The civil society, the political parties, the 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 legislature, legislatures, Lok Sabha. You know, they were they were all alive. But that's not the case now. Therefore. But what puzzles me is, how did this come about? The project didn't die, but there was, there was a very steadfast opposition to that. There was a fight. Today, there is no fight. There's, there's, in fact, the fight is slowly shifted to that ground. As, as, as I said, you know, you know, I'm also Hindu, but then not this kind of Hindu. No, it's not that. I think it should be. And therefore, therefore when, 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 when people told you know, so many people. I mean, why did, you know, when, when they were on the verge of um, victory, why did the Congress say that, you know, they would ban Bajrang then? What's wrong? So, even if, even if Congress were to lose 
the election, but declaring that they would ban Bajrang Dal is, in my mind, is no sin. You're standing for, up for a value. It may not be electorally paying you, all right. But people wanted, you know, that kind of a, look, be clever, be compromising, what's, what's wrong, just don't, don't say these things, you know, be a bit namby-pamby about these things, win the election, come to power. Coming to power, sitting in the legislature, sitting in Vidhan Sauda is not the solution to this. There's much deeper, the challenge is much deeper. Thank you. Uh, so three points which I wanted to briefly touch on. The first, as an economist, do you think this is a natural consequence of India, I mean, the previous regime being neoliberal? Because that's what I read, and I'm a, not even a lay economist. And second, there's one, you know, the hemlock and poison has been so effectively administered that we have a whole generation, previous and a new generation, which thinks the problem is because of the founding principles. So how do we address that? That's a second. And finally, the question on a legislature, coming to your point about legislating. There's a new kind of fight in the legislature, real fist fight. So do they need a grand building like that to fight? <laughs> we, can, we can probably build a, a number of boxing rings. Yeah. We can build a, a, a number of boxing rings in, in the place of Vidhan Sauda and then legislate. But, you know, these are serious questions. I, 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 I do not have uh, answers, I do not have solutions, but, you know, I want uh, this forum to go away from here. People like you should go away from here to, and, and, you know, think about it and make other people think about it. Of course, about legislators and legislatures, I've already spoken. You know, this neoliberal consensus that government is not in the business, government business is not to be in business, you know, this kind of a thing. Welfareism, you know, rave culture, against it, against it, all that. Let's think about this. In a country, in a backward country like ours, which has so many fault lines, which has, you know, uh, very stratified, there's a lot of discrimination. Discrimination on the basis of, you know, not what you do, just because of your birth. <laughs> Look, I'm not chosen to be born in a particular mother's womb. It's not my choice, not your choice. But just because you're born that, you are not supposed to, you know, come, you're not supposed to enter, you're not supposed to touch a book, you're not supposed to, you know, do this, you're not supposed to, um, you, you, you become, uh, you, you be content with being second class, or you go to Pakistan, you know, these kind of things, you know, they are, they, these are happening. And, you know, I pointed out, you know, uh, a lot of people who are now in the IITs, IIMs, professions, etc., etc., they are very receptive to these ideas. That is the impact of neoliberal economy. In the sense, what did neoliberalism do? It is not done only, you know, bringing, uh, you know, um, um, outsourced uh, jobs into, you know, Bangalore and places like that. It's not just that. It has changed your education agenda. It has changed how your public universities are funded. You, it has changed, you know, how. Uh, what kind of a syllabus now, not, I'm not talking about just removing a particular era and putting in a particular era, no. But you see, people who are very receptive to these ideas, as I said, IIMs and IITs, etc., they have absolutely, completely ignorant of social sciences, history, and things like that. They depend on a, a, a few forwards. And what, what kind of a forward do you get? You know, um, in fact, uh, I was telling Prem yesterday, you know, th there is, uh, there used to be a slander against Jawaharlal Nehru. I don't know how, how many people have, or if I'm saying this, maybe I'm giving currency to it, but it's written in Francine Frankel's book. 
that you know when ashoka hotel was built in uh, in 1952 to host unesco meeting and when jawaharlal nehru was the prime minister at that time these forces have brought out a pamphlet saying that you know why ashoka hotel is being built ashoka hotel is being built to serve a particular kind of breakfast for jawaharlal nehru is more serious than that what kind of a breakfast this man the brown sahib i mean he is englishman but you know in 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 indian body he likes a particular kind of veal you know what is veal it's a, it's it's a calf meat so this pamphlet went on to say that early morning at 3:30 4 o'clock a pregnant cow is brought every day to to ashoka hotel and six or seven well built men would jump on its stomach and it ejects a calf that's the tenderest meat this is being cooked for jawaharlal nehru that is why ashoka hotel was built this is the pamphlet which has come and it is recorded in francis frankel's book and you thought whatsapp forwards are bad <laughs> you know this is the kind of uh, uh, ecosystem that can be built if people are not you know lettered people are not uh, you know uh, exposed to uh, you know what's our history etc you know premchand wrote all his short stories in urdu script it's an indian language it's not, it's, not, it's not a religious language dr chennarid who was our chief minister he studied in hyderabad usman university he, he did his medicine in urdu medium urdu is a language is a language it's an indian language but today you know uh, vajpayee used to say magar but adwari would use would say lekin so magar is out lekin is in <laughs> istifa is out tyaga patra is in so it is it is multi pronged at the level of you know language at the level of uh, uh, history at the level of you know these things you know all this so neo liberalism the kind of neo liberal consensus that we had seen in india after 1991 you know they they want us to look it should be a rich country you know why why india was not rich Well, what did Jawaharlal Nehru do? What was he doing? What is this? You know, I don't know how many of you know. Do you know the the size of the first five-year plan? It's about fifteen hundred crores. Fifteen hundred crores. Five-year plan. I'll tell you one more. Give me a minute. I'll tell you. <laughs> you see, we used to have a chief minister called Mr. Jalaga Mangal Rao. In in the seventies, mid seventies, he went to Delhi. and came back after 3 days and media was not so active as it is today so before coming to hyderabad he called up his chief minister's office his pa there was no cmo those those days just he also used to like every other minister he, chief minister also used to have uh, you know one pa and one ps kind of a thing and he wanted to meet the editors in bigampet airport so everybody was surprised why why the chief minister wants to meet us so all of them went then he came he got down the, from the flight he came he sat in the reserved lounge all the editors were sitting and he said look the planning commission was to give me a plan sanction of 364 crores for next financial year but i stayed in delhi for three more days fought with them and got 365 crores <laughs> it's not enough it's not it, it's not over he said my government like this he said you know next the papers showed his photograph like this my government is going to spend 1 crore per day you know that was the that was the economy you know if you if you ask if you ask me today why didn't jawaharlal nehru build so many things you know, he, there was no money 
you 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 need to run to Soviet Union to build Bilai. You run to you know Germany to build an IIT. You run to somebody else to build something else. You know all these things. Money is not what it is today. It was not resources were not not available. Through and you know the Cold War and you know uh, if if um, they don't give you technology, these people will don't give you money. So many things. Unless you, you join CINTO, you join CETO, you will say, you know, you vote in, in favor of them in the UN, and all that. So many things were there. The political, international political situation was different. International monetary situation was different. You know, the kind of resources that we had were different. The kind of, you know, literacy was around 12%, doesn't it, Trump? About 12% when we, when we became independent. No, why didn't you not have that? It's not possible. There was nothing there. So, the, so these things are not known to people, and they get a forward. Why? No, today people ask me, why didn't John Nehru do that? How, what do I say? They they ask this question because you know they they don't know about it. They have no clue. Uh, last question. The gentleman at the back is standing very patient. I have the last question patient. for the evening. Yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, we, have, we have heard about Nehru, we have heard about the slaughter of the, uh, the, uh, the cow and then whatnot. But I think we're getting carried away with, with all the, the um, diatribes, if you may. The focus is on what is the new narrative for rebuilding India? Are we going to build it on the, uh, the misfits and the, the, uh, the falls and then the, uh, the hurdles that we had to cross after the Nehru clan and whatever? Uh, you mentioned briefly about the resources. I think we, if the confiscated resources from the royal clans from the India, if 1% would have been put to work, we could have rebuilt India back then. We didn't have to go big around the world. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, IAT to ISC, I'm an ISC product, proud ISC product, any ISC here. Um, the new narrative to rebuild India is on several pillars, uh, 12 to be precise. And uh, I think that should be the focus on it, not on Hindutva. The definition of Hindutva, we don't have to go forward. But if we move from here forward for the next decade, when the whole world is watching on what India is going to do. Uh, I'm coming, I'm coming to it. One second. One second, hold on a second, please. Um, the question is, after all these uh, hurdles and pitfalls and whatnot, the definition of neoliberal, neoliberalism according to you, and then is there a definite plan how according to you that we need to move forward? Thank you very much. Uh, before Dr. Prabhakar answers that, I would take issue with one uh, characterization. These weren't diatribes. Talking about real issues are never diatribes. I'd like to make that point. They were actually diatribes. Yeah, one of the things that we've learned in recent times is that words have meanings and those meanings can cause problems, which is why I stepped in. Yeah, thank you. Is there a, is there a pointed question that uh, I, I, I want you to answer? I think the question was, what is the new narrative for India and what is the plan that you have that, that I don't you would have, recommend? I've I'm, I'm, I'm not come here to you know, give a narrative. I'm, I'm just flagging some issues, sir. I want all of us to think about it. And I only raise some issues. You see, um, many people asked me, you know, something similar, not exactly in your words, but something similar is that, OK, you're, you're crit being critical of this. Tell me what's the alternative. I don't have an alternative. Alternative will be decided by, no, no, we are not having dialogue. We're not, have a, not having a dialogue. Let me, let me just say, uh, I don't have an alternative. And I also do not think that I should earn my right to be critical only after I am armed with an alternative. No. I assert my right to be critical. That's it. It's a, it's, a, it's a citizen's right. Solutions have to emerge from the people, 
from the wider debate. That's what. Neoliberalism is very simply put in layman's language is giving primacy to the market. The state is just there, let the market forces you know, education. Whoever pays, well, why not? Pay. You're, you're being, but how can I pay? I don't have an income. Why, why don't you have an income? Why can't you have an income? Because I'm born in a disadvantaged region, religion, or community, or caste, or whatever. It's not my fault. And I want the Rajam, the state, to pull me up, to spend some resources on me, taking from him, taking from all of you, you know, just give me some aid so that I can also come up. Now, if you say it should be determined by the market forces, merit, etc., etc., and I'm not saying that, you know, that's completely wrong, but I feel that it is insensitive to the disadvantages that, that have that we we have in our society, it's a, it's a very stratified society. It's a very unequal society, not only economic inequality, inequality, but you know, inequality in India also. There is a chapter in the book. There's there are lots of inequalities. Now, for instance, you know, I am born in a privileged family. By the time I was born. You know, uh, my family was rich. You know, it had land holding, it had uh, political power, it had political prestige, influence, and all that. And you know, I interact. You know, I, I go to good schools, I, I go to good universities, and you know, I get. Uh, you know, my, and my my classmate is you know uh, son of another industrialist, and you know, I get just a walk-in interview, and I get in. But somebody who is born in a, in a very small village, in a very underprivileged, uh, you know caste and you know, social background, you know, he struggles. He, he can't even utter a few words. And he's, he's, he's completely out of the pale. How do, how do, we, how do we tackle that? Should, should, should the state, should the government not care for those people? If, if that is not the function of the state, what is the function of the state? Is the function of the state only to, or the, is the responsibility of the state only to be to the privileged? Only to people belonging to particular religion, only to the people belonging to particular uh, caste, only to the people belonging to particular uh, particular uh, you know region. No, it's not. The state has to look after. This is the definition of the non-neoliberal consensus. Then the opposite is the neoliberal consensus. Frederick Hayek and people like that. Uh, if we could request Mr. Guha to come up for a minute, we'd like to release the book.